Uh, let me begin by thanking Lisbon Council for inviting me to speak to you today. Thank you, Dr. Isaac, for your very important presentation of uh, this very interesting report. Thank you, Anne, for your introductory and also very kind remarks. Uh, you know that this renewed Lisbon strategy for growth and jobs is close to my heart, not only because it's called Lisbon, <laughs> uh, but so it's always good for me to be present in these occasions to discuss with people that I know broadly share the same commitment, myself and my team, to uh, promote this idea of a modern, open, inclusive Europe. I'm also pleased to be here because this conference is an important event, not least because it takes place immediately before the Spring European Council. I expect it will generate a number of positive messages that I can take the European leaders next week. And I promise you I will take with me one of those reports. I will show to some of my colleagues in the European Council that the opinion about the strategy and the way it's working is not only the opinion of the Commission, but independent institutions like yours and many others, in fact, confirm overall that we can be happy with the results and that we can and should, as was just now said, keep the momentum of the Lisbon strategy. This uh, European Growth and Jobs Monitor 2008 was just now presented by Dr. Heiser, makes indeed an impressive and in in invaluable contribution in that sense. It is, I think, a helpful tool, the conclusions of which are very much in line with our own, even if we are not applying all the time the same methodology. <laughs> Uh, we cannot uh, use the name and shame that uh, you are doing regarding the member states, but it is interesting that with different methodologies we can come, broadly speaking, to the same conclusions. And I think this is also helpful for the debate about this. The global economic outlook is not quite so positive, of course, as it was uh, expected to be. Difficulties in the international financial sector are still working their way through the system, with negative fallout in the US in particular, but of course the European Union economy will not be immune to these negative uh, developments. As conditions deteriorate, the voices of those who feel threatened by globalization get louder. The confidence of those who want to raise the drawbridge and retreat into a fortress Europe gets stronger. They are wrong, as I will show later. But first, it is worth recalling, I think, what the Lisbon strategy can and cannot do. Lisbon won't free the European economy from natural business cycles. It will not bring an end to the sort of external shocks we are witnessing today. What it can do is improve Europe's growth potential through structural reforms. It can make our economies more flexible and resilient. And it's working. 6.5 million new jobs in the last two years, an increase in productivity growth for the first time in 10 years, unemployment the lowest in 25 years. In other words, Lisbon is a strategy for all seasons. It was right when the economic conditions were sunny, and it is right now that storm clouds are gathering on the horizon. This is my message to the European Council contained in the communication on Europe's financial sector adopted by the Commission last week. Yes, we have had to clip our growth forecast slightly, but Europe is still predicted to grow 2% this year, not exactly what one would call a recession. And this too is a sign that Lisbon is working as the acceleration is mitigated by the reforms that have already been carried out. Europe would be in a much worse state today if the Lisbon strategy had never existed. So I agree with your report when it notes, and I quote, the worst response to the global downturn would be to abandon the policies that made Europe successful again, at precisely the moment when they have begun to work, end of quote. This will be, with this or other words, my message to the European Council uh, next week. After all, the reasons for reform are still with us, and they will be there for the time being. Globalization is accelerating. The emerging economies are increasingly making their presence felt. We are beginning to feel the impact of demographic change in Europe. Equally, the opportunities offered by emerging market dynamism are still there for those with the courage to reach out and grasp them. 
As I say repeatedly, this can be not a zero-sum game. Europe does not have to resign itself to a shrinking slice of the pie. Globalization is making the whole pie bigger, and there are great opportunities for Europe. Don't just make, take my word for it. In the last week alone, two independent studies have provided a wealth of evidence on how Europe is indeed benefiting from globalization. The European Economic Advisory Group report, Europe in a Globalized World, illustrates the correlation between globalization and an increase in employment in Europe over the last decade, for example. A study I launched last week by John Hopkins University shows how Europe's open economies have benefited from globalization. Above 60% of the European Union 15 experts in 2006 went to developing countries, which is almost 10 percentage point more than in the beginning of the decade. Enormous levels of foreign direct investment have reached Europe in recent years, creating jobs, allowing for great technological advances, improving competitiveness. The study shows that Europe remains the top destination of U.S. foreign direct investment, with the region accounting for nearly 59%, 59% of total U.S. investment outflows in 2006. That's a healthy global share and higher than at the start of the decade when it was only 55%. Over the balance of this decade, Europe has accounted for more than half of U.S. overseas investment, 53%. Belgium alone, it's amazing, a country of 10 million people, Belgium alone received 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars between 97 and 2006. In recent years, the United States has invested four times as much in Belgium as it has in China. And these are the facts and the figures. So that's why we have to look the figures and not only to what is fashionable to say sometimes. The same study shows that thanks to globalization, over the past 10 years, the European economy has created 18 million more jobs than it has lost. Do we really want to turn our backs on this by applying the brakes on reform? I think the answer is clear. It is this context, then, that the European Union is poised to launch the next cycle of the Lisbon strategy. And the key message of the Commission to the European leaders is clear. The Lisbon strategy is working. We do not need a new strategy. We do not need changes to the integrated guidelines. We just need to redouble our efforts and build on the good work already done and concentrate on implementation, on delivery. I know sometimes it's more appealing, I would say it's more sexy to be all the time inventing new concepts and new policies. I mean, but if it is working, let's keep it. Let's be consistent. Let's be coherent. Let's be able to keep the momentum. This is very important, and not to be all the time changing, namely because Europe today is a big ship. You cannot be all the time uh, changing in terms of the broad policy orientations. We can and should adapt to different circumstances, as we have now to adapt to different situations, namely in the financial sector. Yes, this we have to do, but we cannot all the time be changing what are strategic lines for the position of Europe uh, in the world. That does not mean, as I'm saying, that the Lisbon strategy is a static process, far from it. The Commission strategic report, which will be discussed by European leaders next week, sets out a series of new policy initiatives to make Europe even more resilient to economic turmoil and to reinforce European efforts to shape and fully benefit from globalization. Let me take a look briefly at some of them. First, most important area, you have highlighted it, people. In the past, they were just, as some doctrine said, a factor of production. People, at least in our view, it's not a factor of production. People is the most important thing we have in the world and in Europe as well. In the emerging knowledge societies of the future, they are central also to the success of our economies and of any business. It is vital that we prepare every young European with the tools they need to flourish in the world of work. That is why it is important, the cultural attitude and the signals that we give to young people. It is very important because if we give to our young people the idea that globalization is going to destroy Europe, I don't think we are equipping them with the right attitude to face it. But if we tell them, there is a whole lot of opportunities there. 
this new world you are living, you can succeed there. I really believe that we Europeans are in a great position to do it, benefiting from our history, from our tradition, for the cultural sophistication, for the capacity of understand variety and diversity. So the cultural issue, even before the economic one, the cultural issue in the broad sense, in terms of the attitude to knowledge and change, is, I believe, decisive. That is why I insist European leaders should have a positive attitude towards globalization and not exploit the fear that sometimes some populists in the right or in the left like to exploit, to create fear in our public opinions. This is why in our strategic report we have chosen to focus on these issues of education and innovation, and we have mentioned specifically one of the most, if not the most vulnerable group, early school leavers. We still have that problem in Europe, in many of our systems. People that leave school too young, and that we are not prepared to give them another opportunity and to devote to them more time and more effort and more energy. With globalization, the number of unskilled jobs in our economy is bound to decline. There is a real danger that those with few or no skills will become unemployable with all the social consequences that flow from that. We must help them to acquire the skills they need to succeed. We cannot just stand by and see the talents of a section of our, our youth go to waste. The figures speak for themselves. The better educated you are, the less the risk that you will become unemployed. Recently, for example, unemployment among 25 to 64 years old was just 4.7% compared with 11.2 for those with only a lower secondary education. Just 7% of the former were at risk of poverty compared with 20% of the latter. So in social terms, this is indeed the most important cleavage, if you look at it from a broad perspective, the level of education. That is why I believe we should do more in terms of skills. We need to develop skills today that we need tomorrow. I hope and I expect that the Spring European Council will call on the Commission to undertake a major skills review for Europe and make the necessary proposals to ensure that the right skills are available when needed. There is some urgency. Already today, millions of vacancies in Europe are unfilled because there are not enough people with the right skills to fit, fill them. Just yesterday I was in the SEBIT, together with Chancellor Merkel, President Sarkozy, and very important business leaders. And one of the problems we have in the IT industry in Europe is that we do not have enough people. So there is indeed a gap that we have to fill as soon as possible. One in six vacancies in um, advanced tech network technology, which includes mobile telecommunications, one in six vacancies cannot be filled. Only three years ago, this was one in 12 vacancies. This is a fast-growing sector for employment, and you cannot let this situation get worse. And always remember that what is good for Europe citizens, I think, is also good for business. They need a highly qualified and adaptable labor force. Another key pillar of Lisbon's strategy we have returned to is research and innovation. Put simply, we need more research and development investment in Europe, particularly in the private sector. Companies are increasingly willing to break up their research and development operations and distribute them around the world. To keep investment coming in, Europe must increase its relative attractiveness. Because companies want to be close to growth markets in Asia, we have to bend over backwards to convince them that they are also better off investing here. I think the European Union target of spending 3% of GDP on research and development has helped to focus minds. We may not reach this target by 2010, but we are defin definitely moving in the right direction. All member states have now set national research and development investment targets. If these are met, the EU will be spending 2.6 of its GDP on R&D by 2010 up from 1.9 in 2005. So it is not perfect, as your report has highlighted, but we are in the right direction. And there is a special effort to be made in the private sector, because it's fair to say that our member states, generally speaking, 
are now committing to much more ambitious targets in this area. I'm well aware that businesses, particularly SMEs, are the biggest drivers of innovation. That's why we have a policy of helping SMEs to realize their full potential as vehicles of innovation. We need a fifth freedom of Europe in Europe, the free movement of knowledge, to complement the other four freedoms on which the single market rests. Researchers must be able to take up positions in other European Union countries easily. We must, where possible, coordinate policies to avoid wasteful overlaps and application. We must take the most of the European dimension. The truth is that we are still um, living in research and uh, in universities in a very fragmented um, situation in Europe. We have top class world universities, very open, but if you look afterwards at the majority of the situation of our member states, we see that universities are still um, in many cases too parochial, if I may use, use the word. The Commission is proposing to launch a new generation of world-class research infrastructures which far exceed the capacity of any single member state, top-class laboratories, the most modern databases, cutting-edge lasers. This is how we attract and retain the brightest and the best in Europe. This is indeed uh, something where we can give a contribution to attract more people from other parts of the world. I once said it in a press conference, why are we in Europe able to attract the best footballers in the world from Africa or Latin America and not the best researchers in the world. There must be something there to explain. Someone said it's because the United States are not good in football. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think, I think uh, in Europe we also have a great soft power. We have a great soft power. The question is to mobilize it and take also some concrete measures like the one we have launched recently. I hope the member states will agree the so-called blue card, also to make it more concrete, to have bright people from, from, from India coming and here, and uh, why, uh, why are not coming? But the best thing is not only administrative facilitation, the best thing is to have a real atmosphere that drives innovation and research, cross-fertilization, that spirit that we have in some parts of Europe, but not everywhere to be, to be honest. We also need to do more joint programming. We can expect faster progress, and we need to support open innovation. At the same time, we need to ensure that knowledge is suitable, protected by European patent and copyrights. The third priority we have looked at is the business environment. We have got to get this right. As I have said many times now, business needs red carpet, not red tape. We need a single market that works for Europe. We need public administrations that are modern, innovative, and client-focused. We need more small business, and more of them need to grow into world-beating companies. That is why I will be asking the European Council next week to endorse the idea of a Small Business Act for Europe. I will be proposing an act that removes legal and administrative obstacles to SME growth at all stages of their development. The Commission is now consulting the stakeholders. Our aim is that the Small Business Act will help unleash the full potential of SMEs. The final Lisbon pillar we have revisited in our strategic report is energy and climate change, the defining challenge of our generation. Let's finally lay to rest the idea that there is a trade-off between high standards of environmental protection and competitiveness. There is not. Just look at some of the Nordic countries and some of those you have presented. We can do well by doing good. Europe must lead the world in the shift to a high-tech, low-carbon economy. That does not mean putting industry out of Europe. Exactly the opposite. We need more modern, innovative industry in Europe. The question is to have the greening of uh, our industries. The question is to invest more in innovative technologies. The, the question is to have the first mover advantage to what I believe will be inevitably the trend of the future economy. Hearing again, I'm impressed and encouraged by your report which devotes a special section to the link between environmental sustainability and economic development. Energy efficiency in particular, it appears, goes hand in hand with greater prosperity. If I may once again quote yesterday my participation in the SEBIT, an over um, summit uh, for information um, for ICTs, they have decided to put their 
first topic precisely the contribution of ICTs for energy efficiency and climate change policies. And there is enormous, enormous untapped potential there. Uh, we can think about 40% of possible energy savings and the most enlightened of those industries are already looking at the great business opportunities there are in that sector and that we in Europe are not yet fully exploring and one of the reasons is because we do not yet have a real completed internal market in Europe. This is when we compare with our American friends, I mean, a company in the United States when it goes from New York to, to, to California, they know broadly, broadly they have the same market. This is not yet the case in Europe. So it is not just a question of the, the venture capital firms. This is also important, but it is also the idea of having or not an uh, internal market. And it's very difficult for ICTs to have regulatory constraints different in 27 markets. <laughs> and uh, yesterday we received a clear backing from the business for a real internal market, also for telecommunications and ICT in general in Europe. So let's go get down to business and complete internal market, including for energy. Let's uh, see member states set mandatory energy reduction targets for government buildings and systematically include energy efficiency as an award criteria for public procurement, for instance. Ladies and gentlemen, reform is not about rolling back valuable social advances. It is about equipping people to succeed in times of change. We want the, to keep the European attachment to the principles of a social market economy. This is our goal. The question is how to modernize our social market economy in the age of globalization. The question is how to give our people the chance to take control of their own lives, being the best they can be. It is about modernizing our social systems and securing their sustainability. It is about a dynamic business environment where entrepreneurs are spending their time and resources on producing high quality goods and services that people from Europe and from all over the world want to buy. It is about a low carbon economy that is good for the environment and good for business, an economy that provides rising living standards but which does not cost the earth. That is why continuing reform is so important. That is why the message of the Commission to the European Summit next week will be let's keep the momentum. That is why new, this new cycle of Lisbon reform will not be the last. Thank you for your attention.